Good morning and welcome to PSG of Mercer County and of course, happy Aloha Friday. And so PSG of Mercer County, the professional service group of Mercer County is a group that is here for you, anybody that is in any kind of career transition. And in addition to being Aloha Friday, today is National Zipper Day. And uh, has nothing to do with asking somebody to be quiet, zipping. It commemorates when the patent for the modern zipper was issued. It was this date in 1913. So if you uh, look at the fly in your pants, it's uh, been being celebrated for 109 years. So you have zipper anywhere, I guess, 109 years. Uh, wanted to let you know uh, of an event that's also coming up at the library next week, just before we get into our program. So you may want to go to the Princeton Public Library's website, princetonlibrary.org. Look at their event calendar from May 5th at 7 o'clock. Author Jeremy uh, Schiffing, Sch Schiffling sorry, uh, will be um, doing a virtual presentation on conquering LinkedIn but the presentation will be held both in person and virtually. So you can go to the library and they're having a little bit of an event and projecting uh, Jeremy. And they're also gonna have a um, book giveaway. Uh, I believe they have 20 or 25 copies of his book. And so you may be one of the lucky recipients of the book. So if you want, go to the Princeton Public Library's website, go to their event calendar, check that out. I thought that was pretty interesting. So while we were just getting on this morning, I wanted to make sure that I, uh, you had the opportunity to hear that program. Um, PSG of Mercer County is here to provide you, anyone in a career transition, any kind of support, guidance, information, all, all what you need to help make you more efficient and more effective in your own job search. And so we do have a number of tools that we uh, provide to you. We do have our LinkedIn group. Our LinkedIn group is over 1,700 members strong, not just 1,700 LinkedIn members, but these are all people that have been to at least one of our meetings in person or virtually. So it's a little bit of a private group. When you click the join button, we do pre-screen and check to make sure that anyone who asks to join a group has shown up at at least one of our meetings. We are able to check either the attendance from the virtual meeting program or attendance from our groups. And so uh, we want to make sure that all the members and participants in our LinkedIn group really kind of get and understand job search, the importance of joining a job seeker support group. And we do that really just to kind of keep out the name collectors and the group collectors, people that join groups just for their own benefit. So uh, when you join our group, and uh, if you haven't, I encourage you to do so. And uh, if you are a member, continue to be active, uh, share articles that you hear, uh, share job leads. You know, maybe you got that terrific email from a, about a wonderful position that just doesn't apply to you. Copy and paste that into the group and share it with others because your activity in LinkedIn, especially in LinkedIn groups, does help LinkedIn understand that you're an active participant and they could raise you a little bit higher in search results when someone is searching for someone like you. So when they search for you directly, you'll just come up. But when they search for someone like you, if they're searching for a sales executive or CPA or whatever, you want to come up higher in the list. So we'll be active in our LinkedIn group. In addition, <coughs> excuse me, we do have our website. Our website is psgofmercercounty.org, psg.mercer of mercycounty.org. It is over 120 web pages of content. So it's more than just a landing page and, a, and an event calendar. We have lots of information. We have an open jobs page. Actually, it's a number of pages that are there where we have links to over 2,600 company career pages, all within either Mer Mercer County or the six border counties around Mercer County. So that's kind of like our core geography. Of course, we welcome members from all over the country to come visit us, but that's what our open jobs page. And what's nice about that is we don't post the company's uh, positions. What we do is we link to their career pages. And so then you click to their career pages and hopefully they've done a good job of keeping those current. Use those pages also to create a targeted company list. These are companies that do have positions uh, within our kind of service radius of Mercer County and the border counties. And so you can use that to create an initial targeted company list. Now, I can't promise you that every type of position they have is available in the office that's local, because sometimes they're big companies with lots of offices, but you do get to see lots of companies and positions, over 2,600 companies among all those pages. 
So those are the resources that we have. And of course, we are here every week as we try to be uh, to, pr to provide wonderful programs, terrific information to you from our very experienced and dedicated presenters. And so in just a moment, I will introduce uh, Lynn Frankman, who's just graciously uh, dis uh, offered to come and present to us. I'm so excited about this program today, and I hope you get a lot out of it. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> And so uh, with that, I will say that PSG of Mercer County is pleased to welcome Lynn Franklin. Lynn spent most of her career showing executives how to connect with investors, the media, and their employees. Along the way, she became a neuroscience nerd, translating how the brain works into practical, easy to use communication tools. Lynn is a leadership communication consultant, coach, and speaker, and past president of the National Speakers Association in uh, the Illinois chapter. She wrote, Getting others to do what you want, and that's available on her website, which I will post in chat in just a moment. And uh, is, she's working on her next book, Leaders on Rapport, Secrets to Creating Successful Connection. Lynn's TEDx talk on how to be a mind reader went viral with nearly 5 million views, and I will post that link in the chat in just a moment as well. So PSG of Mercer County is very pleased to welcome international speaker, executive communication, consultant and coach, Lynn Franklin. Thanks, David, and good morning, everybody. Let's start out with two myths that most people have about job interviews. And the first one is that being anxious about this is bad. Because, you know, how many of you have thought, geez, I would really love to go in there and feel so calm and so relaxed when I do my next job interview? Okay, here's the truth. I'm a neuroscience nerd, so I study how the brain works, and here's what I know. You need a certain amount of anxiousness in order to perform well. So the goal of going into any kind of interview situation, not feeling any anxiety at all, is not only unrealistic, but it's counterproductive. Because if you were so calm going into a job interview that you felt actually no anxiety at all, chances are good you'd, be, you'd pluff it. So the idea is embrace the fact that this makes you nervous. Being nervous is okay. What you want to do is make sure that it's the nervousness that enhances your performance, so you're doing the prep stuff in advance, rather than the nervousness because you're just winging it which is, in my experience, the result or, or the catalyst for screwing things up. So that's myth number one. Myth number two has to do with power in an interview situation. We have a tendency to believe that the person who's interviewing us has all the power, which means we come into this situation feeling one down. You know, this person, they have the power to hire me or not, and so I need to you know, get their attention and do all these things. And, you know, and so it's like you're striving to get equal footing. I say no, which is why the title of this is turning an interview into a powerful conversation. The scoop is, yes, this person has a job and that job is to make sure that they hire the correct person for this spot. But you also have a job. You need to be interviewing the interviewer about what this company is like so that you can make a good decision about whether or not this job is for you. So to a certain extent, you both have the same goal, which is to make sure that if the two of you choose to work together, that it's a good thing. And that if it's not a good thing, that, you know, that you say, you're the one who says no. Because you know, how many of you have ever taken a job and you knew you shouldn't have? Right, okay. So we want to prevent that from happening. That's why all the tips I'm going to share this morning have to do with making sure that we come prepared and we make good things happen. And now let me see why I can't advance my slides. There we go. Okay. We're going to be paying attention to three things to achieve that goal. First, what are you going to do before the interview? And this is not the stuff you hear all the time. It's not research the company. It's not research the person who's gonna be interviewing you. It's not write down all the questions you want the answers to and the questions you know you're going to get. You would just do that automatically. This is not your first rodeo. So we're digging deeper 
into what it is that we need to do beforehand. The second thing we'll do is talk about how to build rapport. Because as David mentioned, I interviewed almost 100 different leaders of all kinds of stripes and asked them, what's your secret to building rapport quickly? And I will share with you the things that leaders do in order to build rapport so you can use that stuff when you're in a job conversation. And then finally, strategic Q&A, which is all about how do you turn every question you get asked into the right one by how you answer it. That's where we're gonna be spending time this morning. Let's dive right in. Here are the things we do before, oh, by the way, and if you have questions or comments or something that you feel the need to share, please type it in the chat or un you know, unmute yourself and ask those questions. This is not one of those hold your questions to the end thing. Is here's the truth. Chances are, if you have a question about something, other people do too, and they will be grateful that you asked. And excuse me, Lynn, there is a question from Michael. So Michael, if you want to unmute, ask your question. All right, hey, Michael. Good morning, Lynn. This is not so much a recent thing, but back in the day when I was still working as a chemical engineer, because a lot of times I got relocate, um, you know, flown to a company for an interview. They, you know, they don't, they're not going to fly you back and forth 20 times. So you spend the whole day interviewing with people. And then a lot of times it's people who would be your coworkers. And occasionally you would get a, a hard ass type who was like, I'm going to try to figure out, you know, how I can throw this guy off or whatever, because they have no idea how to interview. So they're just, you know, throwing throwing whatever at the wall and seeing what sticks basically, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know how you play things strategically to get your point across with someone who is just, you know, asking questions to ask questions and trying to, to say, well, how do I know you're going to work well with me, for instance? Mm -hmm. Okay. And as a matter of fact, Michael, one of the things that we'll either get to today or you'll get in the notes if we don't have time is you're right. There are plenty of people who ask you questions and they have ulterior motives. And sometimes the ulterior motive is to make you feel uncomfortable or to make them look smart. And there are a whole list of those. I'll share that stuff with you at the end or in the notes, once again, if we don't have time to cover it, and you will get strategies on how to deal with those people. Because you're right. Not everybody wants to be helpful or is there to uh, is there above board. So we'll talk about some of that stuff. And thank you for raising that question, because you're right. There are people out there who are trying to trip you up. Having strategies to deal with them is important. All right, so Michael broke the ice. Now let's dive into what are the other things to do before the interview. All right, and you already know, I'm a neuroscience nerd. I study how the brain works. Here's what I know about setting goals. You have two minds, a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind can process, well, your conscious mind can process between 10 to 50 bits of information per second. Your subconscious mind processes like 14 million bits of information per second. So for example, uh, if I said to you, how does your derriere feel in the chair? Now, how many of you are thinking about how your butt feels in the seat? Right, well, guess what? Your subconscious mind knew that information before I asked, but it didn't, the conscious mind hadn't told it it was important. So when I said, that your conscious your subconscious mind bubbled up that information here's the truth when you set goals you are sending a request from your conscious mind into your subconscious mind which chews on it and tries to figure out ways to help you get that so the best way for you to activate your subconscious mind in service of you having a powerful conversation is to write your goals and you'll probably see, and by the way write them longhand because you have a left logical brain and a right creative brain. And when you sit and write something out longhanded, it actually stimulates both sides of your brain to help you out. And you probably run into the acronym of SMART goals, which you see down here, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. So for example, if I were interviewing for a job, I might, I, my goal might be on April 29th, 
at my 30 minute one o'clock interview with Karen, I will listen to her answers to my questions to see if this is the right job for me. Two, I will present my experience, my relevant experience in solving problems that company faces. And three, we will take the next step, whatever that may be. So if you've already interviewed with Karen or somebody else there, it could be that the next step is to get a job, to, uh, to get an offer, or it could be to be interviewed by the person who is in charge of that area, whatever things. Gather information about the company, present how I solve problems on their pain issues, and take the interview, have the interview go to the next logical place. And the next logical place could also be, that's it. We don't want to go any further. But you can see how much more powerful that is rather than, I want to have a good interview. The more specific you can be, the more your subconscious mind can chew on this and then bubble up the stuff you need to have in order to be successful in this conversation. And by the way, another important point to notice about your subconscious mind, it cannot tell the difference between a positive message and a negative message. So for example, if you're about to walk into a job conversation and you're thinking, they're never going to hire me. Guess what? Your subconscious mind hears they're never going to hire me and it will find ways for you to shoot yourself in the foot every time. Be aware and conscious of the questions that you feed your subconscious mind. It will help you get what you want. Make sure it is what you want. So your first thing is to write down goals before you have your conversation. The next thing is to write your messages. And here's the truth. You've interviewed for jobs before. Chances are you know how to do this stuff. But what I'm asking you to do is be more targeted in what you say. Because here's another neuroscience nerd nugget. And that is people can only hold three ideas in their short-term memory before their short-term memory is full. So if you go in there with 10 things you want people to remember about you, by the time you get to four, They've lost number one, and chances are good. You're standing in number two. Three, the three most important things you want people to remember. And you can have three sub points under each of these, but three main messages. So let's do this exercise right now, because this is a workshop. This is not a lecture. So I want you to pull out a piece of paper, and I want you to either imagine your ideal company, or think of the next place where you're going to be having a job conversation. And I want you to write down, I'll give you a minute to do this, write down what the biggest pain this company is in that you can solve. Nobody hires you because they, just because they like you. They hire you because they have a problem they need you to solve. So write down what is the pain that this company is in that you can solve. And I'll give you a little bit of time to do that. Good. Once again, they hire you to solve a problem. What's this problem that your research on this company indicates they have that you can solve? Which then takes us to the next message you want to share. And that is about your experience. And in this instance, it's the experience that you have in solving the pain that you've identified for the company. Because frankly, most people come in to do a job interview and they talk all about themselves. But if you're talking about, well, my research indicates, my research on, uh, on the industry, I've been in the industry for however, however long you have, if, you, if this is a, a game changer for you, you know, indicates that you know, this is the kind of problem that you're facing. Or you could have read their news releases and discovered that these are the problems they're facing. When you talk about their pain, they know you've done your research. 
And now what you're moving to is, here's how I've solved that problem for other people. And in a minute, we'll talk about storytelling. But once you've identified the pain, identify the experiences that you have had that have led to solving that pain for other organizations. And those are the messages you want to share about your experience. So let's take a moment to do that now, too. You have the pain. Jot down a couple of phrases about situations where you've solved that pain for others. And obviously, these are things you'll want to flesh out later. But this gives you a good start so you're not starting from zero. OK, a good number of savvy people have done this. And you, you may have done some of this before, too, prior to a job conversation. Very few people do this third one, which can be a game changer. And that is your vision for what this department or area or region or company will look like after you have been there for a year and solved this problem. What will it look like? One of the most, once again, neuroscience, one of the most powerful words you can use in any situation is the word imagine. So if you know that their situation is that they have an incredible amount of employee turnover and that's the problem that you can solve, if you had to summarize it all, it would be something like this. I know that Omicron Industries is facing a real challenge with employee retention. When I worked at Z Industries, I was able to take employee turnover from 20% down to 5% because of these three things I did. Now you know the power three. Imagine what it would be like for Omicron if I was able to, if we, if we worked together and I was able to take your turnover down to that level. Your people would be more productive. They would be happier. They would be staying for longer. You'd reach your revenue goals and your earnings would go up. That's my vision for working with you. So now take the next minute and write down samples of how this company could look in a year after you've been there working your magic. You want to remember these, these things because when we get to Q&A, we're going to circle back to them. But now you have a start on them. The three key messages and up to three sub points each makes everything digestible for the person that you're having this conversation with. Because how many times have people talked to you about, it's like drinking from a fire hose when you're having a, a job interview. And you know, like that's a good thing. No, you want to make sure that you share fewer and more memorable answers and messages rather than dumping everything on them. And now you know the messages that will most resonate with people. And here's a better way to deliver them. So we were talking about the second area of your experience. Once again, as a neuroscience nerd, here's what I know about stories. When you tell me a great story, what it does is it slips past my resistance in my thinking brain and speaks directly to my emotional brain. And that is where I make decisions. My thinking brain will resist you. My emotional brain wants to connect with you and make decisions. So speak to my emotional brain. That's the part of me that decides whether or not I'm going to work with you and offer you this position. You tell me a good story, and what ends up happening is that you actually, your brain actually goes back as though what you're speaking about 
is going on with you for the moment, at the moment. Your brain cannot tell the difference between something you're imagining or remembering and something that's actually happening to you right now. And what ends up happening, that's interesting, but what's cool is that the person who's hearing your story, it's as though they're in there with you. So the same parts of your brain that are firing because you're remembering a feeling or an activity, the same thing is going on for them. And you are connected on a molecular level. And when you do this stuff, it automatically lowers the resistance this person has to anything you're going to suggest. And you see here two different stories created by Annette Simmons who wrote a book called Whoever Tells the Best Story Wins. Do not read this book, it's terrible. Her ideas are great though. And here are two stories you can use to share your experience and really connect with the person you're having the conversation with. The first type of story is called a who I am story. And you tell this story to show that you are human and approachable. And you do that by revealing a mistake that you've made and what you learned from it. Let me give you an example. Fred is a 14 year old boy standing three feet away from me. And in this moment, I can't tell you anything about Fred, about how he looks, because all I can see is he is holding the world's largest machete. You try to call for help, I'm gonna cut you. I am the only adult in a boys group home. Fred ran away two days ago and now he's back. And as the only adult, I'm thinking, it's my job to tell Fred what to do. So I look at Fred and I say, you can't be here, Fred. You have to go to intake. You have to tell him what you've been up to so they can clear you and you can come back down. Fred's response, no, I'm going to my room. Fred, why are we having this conversation? Just go to intake. No, I'm going to my room. We can do this the easy way or the hard way. Just go to intake. No, I'm going to my room. So I go to the staff office to call for backup to be with the other boys in Daniel Cottage while I work with Fred to get him to intake. And that's when he follows me to the office, zips up in his backpack, and pulls out what I believe today still to be the world's largest machete. Then he brings down the machete and chops the phone cord, my only lifeline to the outside world. And now, because I'm a neuroscience nerd, I know at that moment I lost my mind. I lost two thirds of my brain. All I can think of to do is babble. But, 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 but Fred, I like you and you like me and you don't want to hurt me. There's nothing in how Fred's looking at me that's saying he's agreeing with any of this. So I just keep babbling. Oh, you don't want to get into the world of hurt you're going to get into if you hurt me. At which point I see Fred blink. And later he'll tell me he started thinking about what his life would be like if he knifed me. That Daniel Cottage where we were would no longer be his home. The boys in the hallway wouldn't be his friends. I wouldn't be there to help him. The police would come and drag him off to juvenile hall and lock him up. But all I saw was the blink. And somehow I knew it was my chance. So I stuck my hand out and I said, Fred, just make it easy on yourself and hand me the knife. And I was scared to death that Fred was going to bring that knife down and chop my hand. But I knew I had to keep it out there. I knew I had to show Fred that I thought he was a good kid and give him the chance to act like one. I can't tell you how long I stood there sweating through everything I had on until Fred finally sighed and handed me the knife. That has become the litmus test for my job. As long as nobody pulls a machete on me, I'm having a good day. Well, okay. Lynn, there's, a, there's another question that came in. This is from Alex. And uh, he, he wrote it here, so I'll just read it. But if needed, he'll, he'll unmute. He wrote, Lynn, often it is impossible to find the company's specific problem. What question to ask about that? Short of blatantly asking, why can't you sleep at night? <laughs> you know, and I am a fan of being direct in job conversations, in part because when you ask a direct question, most of the time people in that role will give you a direct answer. And you're right, it doesn't have to be the what keeps you up at night. It could be what's the biggest problem that you need the person in this job to solve? You can even at that point. And you can start out, you can preface that question by saying, I've done my research on your company and your industry. And here's what I believe the issue is. But as you said, Alex, if you cannot find that issue somewhere, then to say, you know, what, what is the thing 
the, what is the biggest problem or it's the biggest challenge if because you're listening to their language up to now and if they don't say problem they say challenge instead use the words that they use you know, what's the biggest challenge that if this person was able to solve it would make the organization run much better i say be direct in part because you 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 don't know how many interviews this person is going through and how much dancing they end up doing most people appreciate it when you're direct. And Alex, if that did not answer your question, then unmute yourself and let me know. Then uh, I was interviewing many, many people and I was a candidate many, many times. And I'll tell you this, if somebody were to ask me, Alex, what is the biggest problem that you're facing? Probably I will not tell them, look, I have a problem, I have a communication problem, and if I, if my communication problem were to improve, everything in the department will go much, much better. This is what, let's say, I'm just making it up, let's say this is what mm -hmm. I think. I will not disclose this to a person I don't know, just came to my office to interview. So mm -hmm. it's much trickier than that. I mean, you gave a good answer, it's a simple answer. I don't know if it works in all cases. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's true. If you ask the question and you do not get a usable response, you can say exactly what you just said right there, Alex. I can see that you might not feel comfortable sharing that information with me now, and that's okay. But what I'm really here to do is to make things better for your department or make things better for your area. And I wanna share information with you on how I've done that elsewhere so you can see that I can help you. If there if there are you know are issues that you feel comfortable sharing with me, fine, uh, you know, and, and just let it go and sit back and smile. Let <laughs> them make the choice, but let them know that you're interested because you do want to make a difference. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Okay, got a question for all of you, which is, when I told you that story about Fred. Just type in the chat some of the things that you thought about me after you heard that story. Some of the qualities you thought I had. And if you just type those in the chat and David will read them for us, I'd appreciate that. What did you learn about me from hearing that story? And David, as stuff shows up, read it to us. So what's coming in? Compassionate, brave, okay. Cared greatly for Fred. See if any other thoughts come through. Give us another minute. Okay, well, let's start with those three. Okay. The idea is if I sat down in a job conversation and said, I'm compassionate, I'm brave, and I care about other people, you'd think, I have no reason to believe that. But if I show you through a story, that allows you to come up with your own conclusion. And that's more engaging to you. Because here's the truth, and one of the reasons why you won't see lots of bullet points on my slides. When you speak in bullet points or when you share bullet points, the only parts of people's brains that light up are the ones that recognize and interpret language. And that's right in the thinking brain, which is the seat of where everybody will resist you. When I tell you a story, once again, it speaks to your emotional brain, which is where you make decisions. And by the way, because we're voyaging along together in the story, we're, we are literally in the story together. When I talked about the machete, the fear center in my brain went off as though somebody had a machete right there with me now. And the fear center in your brain went off, which is why I said we're connected on a molecular basis. So the more things you can work into about, so I was talking about, what I saw and, and you know and how I was sweating and all these things, the more details that you can work in that activate different parts of people's brains. So visual cortex, when you talk about things you see, auditory cortex, when you talk about things you hear. Um, you know, and uh, so it's it's that kind of stuff. When you add those kinds of details, you're activating more parts of people's brains and helping them voyage along with you in the story. And once again, you're showing rather than telling, and more, more people will believe you if you show. Who I am story. 
you use these stories to show people that you're human and approachable, and you do that by sharing a flaw and what you learned from it. Second type of story is a why I'm here story. And you use a why I'm here story to show people that you don't have a hidden agenda and you're here to work with them. So let me give you an example of that. I was asked to do a 15 minute keynote to a bunch of high school seniors who were coming together for an evening of writing their first resume. And the title of the keynote was given was The Power of Resume. And I thought, yeah, I'd like to sleep through that already. I don't want to show up for that. And I thought, how can I inspire these kids and motivate them to actually spend a night working their resume, working on their resume, their first one? And so I stood up in front of them and said, you know, here's the truth. All of the adults who are here to support you tonight, if you ask them how it felt to write their own resume, and they were being honest, they would give you a look like a cat hawking up a furball. Nobody wants to write their resume. But the scoop is you can't get a job without one, especially not your first job. So we have to find a way to make this doable and not so painful. So let's shift gears for a moment. I said, I'm going to ask you, what do you to shout out the name of your favorite superhero. So I got everything from Spider-Man and Wonder Woman to uh, Black Panther, you know, to Batman. All. And I said, good answers all. An even better answer would be you. You are your favorite superhero because you have one talent or skill that you do better than anybody else you know, anybody in your family or any of your friends, and some company would be lucky to have you do it there. So think of your resume as a one-page graphic novel where you get to share stories about your superpower. And these kids went off engaged, ready to tackle the task. Because when I stood up in front of them, some old lady who was going to bore them about resume, that was what they were guessing I was. But I wanted them to know I was there to support them. So I told them this, which is a why I'm here story. So they'd know that I didn't have a hidden agenda and I wanted to work with them. So as you come up with those messages about your experience, think about who I am or why I'm here stories and see which ones you can tell that will help you break through all of the, the conversations that they're having while everything else they're having is an interview. With you, it's a conversation. Break through all of the other interviews that they're having where people boringly recite stuff to them. And what you're doing is you're engaging more parts of their brain so they feel more connected with you. So does anybody have any questions on these two types of stories, ways that you can more engagingly share your experience? So Lynn, there Why was a think? question Please. from Michael. So Michael, um, I saw you were writing something, but I think it's just easier for all of us if you just speak with Lynn. All right, when um, Alex was talking about how do you get a company to, to tell them what tell you what their problems are <clears throat> also early on in my career but far enough out that i started attending groups like this that you know didn't exist you know when i first started working um for instance as an engineer i you know get an interview and they'd walk you through the, the plant i was a chemical engineer and i'd always do something like, okay, here's this piece of equipment. We can't get it to function right. What would you, how would you solve this problem? And one of the consensus that we got out of these conversations was they didn't really have a job they were looking to hire someone for. They wanted free consulting. They wanted to have an interview candidate tell them how to fix this problem, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we all came to the conclusion that you answer the question by vaguely saying something and, and ending it by, look, you know, if you hire me, I'll fix it for you, you know, because you, you don't want to open your toolbox and solve all their problems on, on the interview such that they don't need you anymore, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and, and that's a, a point that's well taken. Once again, sometimes people ask you questions and they're not asking them in an honorable way. And, and if I were in that situation, my answer would be the process I would go through in order to fix the machine. So I'm not gonna give them advice on how to fix this particular machine. I would say, when I've been confronted with this kind of problem before, and you can give them a specific example, you know, this machine at this company, here's what I did, and here's the result. So once again, you're turning it into an engaging story that shows people how you work rather than giving them free advice and telling them how to fix that machine. You're still getting your point across that you're a strategic thinker and a, and a problem solver. That help, Michael? Uh, yes. I mean, I mean, it does help, but obviously, I guess it really depends, like you said, on what the intention of the person um, doing the interviewing really is. I mean, if they're going to interview around until somebody actually tells them how to fix it and then the position doesn't even really exist i mean you don't know that for mm -hmm. instance or mm -hmm. are they really showing you this so that they can get an idea from you as to how you would approach you know helping them fix their issue i mean mm -hmm. people aren't always honest i guess is uh Right, which is why, yeah, the the answer of, you know, here's how I've done this in other places. So you're showing them your process and the way your mind works, but you're not fixing their machine because it's not your job to do that. And you can actually say, if you, you know, depending upon the, the sense of humor that the person has, you know, and, you know, and if we decide to work together, I, chances are darn good that I'll be able to fix this. Thanks, Michael. You're welcome. Any, any other questions about stories? That's all that's in chat now, but folks, if you have a quick question you want to ask, this may be on this topic so far, or these first three steps, terrific, please do so. Okay, and while you're thinking about that, here's the bonus. How many of you are still doing video interviews? Okay, some of you are. All right. When you're gonna do this stuff, because here's the truth, screens are set up to communicate, but not to connect. And when you're having a job conversation, you actually wanna connect. Here are some things that will help you do a better job, because here's what the research shows. The best predictor about whether or not you will be offered a position is actually your handshake. Honest to goodness, that's what the research shows. You have a good handshake that they like, chances are good that they will offer you the position. I know, it's crazy. But now that we have this data, let's act on it. So in other words, if you're doing a so if you're doing an in-person video, an in-person conversation, let's use your left hand as another person and your right hand is you. And what I want you to do is the other person is now, and do this yourself, get your hands out. The other person is going to give you the most aggressive handshake you can. All right, so do it with me. Yo, know, pump it up and down. Really aggressive handshake. All right. And then, of course, there's the other end of the spectrum where the person comes in with a dead fish handshake. So do one of those on yourself. Yeah. You know, both of them, horrible. So obviously, one of the best things you can do if you've got an in-person interview is practice your handshake. It's crazy, but do it. Make sure that it's not too aggressive and not too weak. You're looking for middle of the road here. When you're doing virtual, the best thing that you can do is pay attention to how you appear on the screen. So for example, I've got your face here. And the optimal amount is to have about 20% of blank above you and you the rest of the screen. Because people are looking at your face. And they want to make sure, you know, once again, it's, it's also where the camera is. You don't want to have the camera so high that you're looking up and, you know, and so people are seeing the top of your head or so low that, you know, that you're looking down and they're seeing your nose. The optimal position is eye level. So check your camera to make sure it's highlighting your face. And obviously your setting. 
if you're doing or when you're doing a job conversation, do not have a virtual background because we've all seen those, haven't we? And if you have a tendency to move your hands, what will end up happening is that people look at the bizarre stuff that's going on behind your hands and they forget what you're saying. You want to limit the amount of distractions in your background. So have a real background that's decluttered or use a green screen that doesn't have the waffle stuff going on. And obviously your posture. You want to sit up straight and you want to lean in just a little bit. That's more engaging to the people who are having the conversation with you. And if you don't already have a Zoom account and you want to see how it is that you look, you can see the link right there, zoom.us slash test. You don't have to sign up for anything. It will just take you to the screen where you can see how you appear for somebody else. And you can make adjustments accordingly. So your video handshake. This is the first thing people see. Set it up well. All right, so now we're going to talk about building rapport during a conversation. This is the results of the research that I mentioned earlier of all these leaders that I interviewed, everybody from you know, CEOs of organizations to social workers and doctors to country music musicians. Here's what they told me is their best ways for building rapport. Not surprisingly, build rapport with your face, in person or online. What ends up happening is that most people when they're concentrating, they have a tendency to frown a little bit because they're thinking hard. The pejorative term for this is called resting bitch face. So I want you to practice resting bitch face with me right now. So, you know, like you're concentrating and you look kind of crudgy. Okay, I'm thinking really hard about this question you're asking me. And you can see how unattractive that is. What you want to do literally is take a deep breath and give me the Mona, Mona Lisa smile. It's the difference between and that makes you look more open and people will interpret you much more kindly than they will if you look unfriendly in person or online. Second is eye contact. Research shows that literally 80% you know, of people in the world value eye contact. 20% don't. If you want to know more about this, that's where my TEDx talk on how to be a mind reader will help you. 80% of people in the world value eye contact and they believe if you are not looking at them, you are not paying attention to them. Knowing this, once again, online platforms are set up to see each other, but not to connect. Here's what you need to practice. Looking at your camera. So what I say to people, when it's the first time I've ever had an on-screen experience with them, I'll tell them, I want you to know that I'm speaking directly to you. And so when I speak, I'm going to be looking at the camera. So you can see, I'm speaking to you. And when you're speaking and you're asking me questions, I'm actually going to be looking at the image of you on my screen because I want to see all of you. I want to see your background. I want to see your body language. I, I, you know, I want to give you my full attention, which means I'm looking at your image on the screen. But if you look at me when you're speaking, I'm going to be looking over here at you and it's going to look like I'm not paying attention to you. So I want you to know that I'm actually paying attention to all of you. And then when I speak again, I'll look at the camera. I call it the elephant in the room. Explain to people why your eyes are going where they're going. This is usually a relief for them because they know that you're making conscious choices about trying to connect with them. And a lot of times then they will do the same thing with you, which helps. So pay attention to where your eyes are going because most people want eye contact and explain to them why you're looking where. So they understand you are giving them your full attention throughout the conversation. And by the way, obviously this works for things other than job conversations. So any questions on that? Because I think I saw one pop up in the chat, maybe. 
Yeah, there is one from a, a different Michael. And his question is, do you recommend keeping your own video on the screen when on a Zoom call or just the other person? And that's a personal choice. If you find your image on the screen distracting, wipe it out. Or you, what you can do is you can move the other person's image right below your camera. Because most, uh, most platforms give you the opportunity, Zoom for sure, give you that opportunity to move your image around so it's not like right below your camera so it looks like you're, feels like you're staring at you. Do whatever makes you feel more comfortable. And thanks for the question. Yeah, terrific. And uh, Michael Kolber has another question. So Michael, please unmute to ask your question. Along the, the way, along the idea of cameras, I've been playing around and not knowing what to do because of the nature of the kind of work I do. I have two monitors sitting in front of me, one to the left and one to the right. It's a desktop computer. My camera is an external camera, which can clamp to the top of one of the monitors. So if, it, mm -hmm. if I have it on the top of one of the monitors, it's not straight in front of my face. So you don't get a straight look at my, at my face. So I've been trying to figure out how to really solve that problem so that when I look at my camera, I can also look, you know, at other people or at, you know, at the presentation and look like, you know, I'm paying attention. The most simple thing to do is raise your chair so that you're at eye level with the camera. And I know that may not mean that you can scooch close into your desk, but for a conversation, switch it up. There are also plenty of cameras that come with their own stands. You're right, the most convenient kind and the kind that I have sits on top of my monitor. And long ago and far away, I used to have my monitor jacked up. I don't anymore. So do whatever you can to get it more eye level, Michael. All right. And there, yeah, there are plenty of other ways. You need to be conscious about that because you don't want this view and you don't want this view. Because then people are paying so, they're paying more attention to how they're being distracted than what you're saying. And that's certainly not what you want to do during this conversation. Thanks. You're right. Camera, camera positioning is important. All right, so let's move to the next thing to build rapport. Build rapport with your interest. And I love this picture of Jonathan K. Park because it looks like he is so fascinated by what it is that we're all saying. And so listen. And basically, there are two types of listening. The most common is called listening to respond, where you're paying attention to what the person is saying and thinking about what you're going to say when it's your turn to speak. And of course, we know the, the, the bad end of that continuum is the people who aren't even listening to us and all they can do is sit there and wait impatiently for us to shut up so they can talk. But in a, in a job conversation, you wanna be listening to respond at the very least. But there's a deeper level of listening that will serve you well. And this is called listening for understanding and empathy. So not only are you listening to the words the person is sharing, but you're truly paying attention to their body language and the other things, the other information you can pick up about them. So you're paying attention to the whole person, not just the content of what's being said, which makes paraphrasing what they're saying important as well. So the idea here is give the person your whole attention. Don't be sidetracked by, okay, so they're talking about this, this problem and here's the problem that I solved. You know, and, and, and you can see where your brain goes and they can see where your brain's going too. When you're there and giving them your full attention, listening for understanding and empathy, here's the truth. Most people wander around, around feeling chronically unseen and unheard. And when you give somebody your full attention, boy, it's like catnip. And so they really appreciate it and they want to reciprocate. So choose to listen at a deeper level, not just to respond. And obviously ask questions. You have a reason to be there too. And ask good questions. 
ask the questions that they might not get from every other job candidate. And do these, by the way, we talked about this at the top, write your questions in advance. Because yeah, you're smart, savvy people, but you'll be under a certain amount of pressure when you're in a job conversation. So if you write the questions in advance, when you're not feeling stressed out, chances are good, you'll come up with more questions and better questions. And you won't have that experience of the end of the conversation and you realize, boy, I should have asked that question. I need to go back and get the answer to that. So you build rapport by listening when other people speak and asking good questions. That's what leaders say. And then that takes us to the final. Give a crap. And here's truth. Here's the truth. If you want to build rapport with people in addition to the other things that we've just talked about, look for ways to compliment them. And honestly, don't make up crap. In other words, it can be something as simple as you see pictures of their family in the background of the, you know, of the room where they're, uh, they're speaking from or the room that you're in with them and ask them genuine questions about other things that go on in their lives or give them compliments about the company's performance. If it's a public company and you've done your research and you know that revenues and, and earnings went up last quarter. Find things to show that you're paying attention to them and their organization and compliment them on this stuff. It could be something as simple as, you know, as the, if it's, if it happens, well, a color that somebody's, wearing, oh, that, you know, that, that tie really looks great on you or, you know, or whatever. You're looking for ways to connect with people in something that you would say that's complimentary to them, but not fake. And the other thing is research shows that there, and, and this is called impression management, which is important during a job conversation. Impression management is making sure that you're, you're leaving the best impression that you can and what results from that. And there are two types of impression management. One is called self-promoting, and you know these people, don't you? They're the people who, every time you ask them a question, whether or not it's in the job conversation, they tell you all the wonderful things that they did. I did this, and I did that, and I accomplished this. You know, and it becomes this long, laudatory list of all the things that they've done. And then there are the other focused people who talk about what they did in concert with others. And research indicates that people who focus on others, who show that they were part of a team that created something and it wasn't just me all the time, those are the people who more often get hired at higher salaries and then continue to get raises. So yeah, don't hide your light under a bushel basket, but also let them know that you've accomplished these things by working well with others. That gives you an edge on being hired, and it also gives you an edge on continuing to get promotions and raises. So that's impression management. This is giving a crap. Truly wanting to connect with that person and not just making it all about yourself. And uh, excuse me, um, Lynn, John has a question. Um, are there or is there a particular question we should always ask? You know, and frankly, I'm gonna to toss that over to Alex because he used to do this for a living. And I'm betting Alex, because I do not interview people for a living, that you have a better answer to that than I ever would. What are some of the questions that you loved getting asked when you were hiring people, Alex? Bear with me and I will give my three questions. There you go. In one second. And by the way, if I, I've been doing this for the last 15 years, and if I ever receive compliments or anything, it's about these questions, and it repeats itself all the time. So for, it, it, it really takes a kind of two parts to it. One is a visual element. Uh, Lynn, ask me, you're interviewing me now, ask me, Alex, do you have any questions for me? Alex, do you have any questions for me? Uh, yes, actually, I prepared three questions. By me just showing this to you, 
this is so powerful because a i differentiate myself from my competition and that, that's by the way a very very big part of the interview process the worst that can happen to you is that you blend into the crowd you're good but mary is also good eh, paul is also good so then you don't get the offer so by me differentiating myself i said yes actually I prepare three questions, you achieve this. You tell them what is coming, it's going to take three, four minutes, and that's it. I can tell you this, that uh, an interview I had in the past, uh, the interviewer said, Alec, do you have any questions for me? I have five minutes, I need to be in my boss's office. So basically, what did he communicate? Alex spit it out fast, I'm already on my way, now uh, just quickly, quickly. And I don't want this to ever happen to anybody else. So by me saying, I have three questions. And by the fact that I show you that I typed it up, I have the liberty to read it. I don't need to memorize. I have plenty of stuff to memorize. So Lynn, here's my first question. What are the three most important traits that you are looking for in a person hired for this job? Mm -hmm. Traits, and I do. I talk about traits because, as you know, there is this saying: we select for skills, but we hire for personality. So let's hear from them. Skills we already discussed. Let's hear about what kind of personality traits you're looking for. The key here is this: when they say, "I'm looking for this and this and this," do not engage. Don't say yes. It's so attractive. You really want to engage say thank you here's my next question mm -hmm. what will be the more challenging part of this job put the monkey on their back let them spit it up let them tell you difficult diff difficulty for an individual joining us will be xyz and the last question is this if hired how can i help you and your team get a gold star in the interview next year this is a different question. The first and second questions are logical questions. The third question is an emotional question. Mm -hmm. Again, I do this because I want to differentiate myself. This is a question they will remember. Oh, Alex was the one that asked if he's hired, how he can help me personally and my team. Unquestionably, this is a question they will remember. So let's mm -hmm. hear what, what they say. The advantage of these three questions is this is the thank you letter. I told you, don't answer. Wait, put your thoughts together. Remember what they answered. Put it in the writing short and send it immediately after the interview. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for that, Alex. That's really helpful. That's really helpful. My pleasure. And, uh, and thanks for asking the question that led to that, that answer. Okay. All right. Last thing we're going to cover is strategic Q&A. And the idea is most of us think of what it is that we want to say. And sometimes we come up with what we think is the ideal question. Well, I hope they ask this question. I got a great answer to this question. Ask me this question. Ask me this question. And they never do. And you leave the conversation unfulfilled because you had this great answer that you never had the chance to give. The idea of strategic Q&A is to turn every question you're asked into the right one by how you answer it. And remember, I had you uh, a little while ago come, to, come up with your three key messages, the, the, the stuff on the pain the organization is facing, the experience that you have, and your vision for how things will look after you've been there for a while. Those are the three main points you're going to want to include as you reach back to do to answer people's questions. So there are there are some techniques we're going to cover. And what I'm going to do is cue this up for you because you see lots of cues there. I would love to be able to work with one volunteer on each of these. Somebody who's willing to take a look at their messages and answer the question using these techniques and I will, I will give you feedback on that so everybody else can learn. The first technique is called bridging. And you see all these Q's and A's here. The first Q is the question that you're asked. The second A that you see there is the answer. And in the first 
type of bridging, you ask yourself a follow-up question and then answer that. So for example, if the question is, why do you think you're the right person for this job? And one of the key messages that you've written down is about your experience. And you say, I have 20 years of experience in this industry. I know the issues that you're facing and the opportunities as well. And then you ask yourself a follow-up question. What does this mean for you? And then you answer that with, it means I will hit the ground running and I can make an impact immediately. You don't have to smarten me up on how to do this job. So the next line is Q small a. So somebody asks you a yes or no question. And it could be, so you think you're the right person for this position. I can't tell you the number of people who will say yes and stop there. That will never be you. So instead, what you'll do is you'll say yes. And here's why I believe that's true. And then you track back to those main messages that you wanna share. I have got 20 years of industry experience. I've solved a lot of the problems that we've talked about that your company is facing. And that means I can hit the ground running right away and show, you know, and show results quickly. Or on the bottom line, we have QAA, which is you don't even bother to ask yourself a follow-up question. The question is, why do you think you're the right person for this position? Because I have 20 years of industry experience, which means I've solved the employee retention problem that you're facing at other firms. And that means I can hit the ground running and have an immediate impact. So bridging, you answer the question that they asked, and then you give a little bit more why this is true. So is anybody willing to do bridging with me? And we'll use that question. Why do you think you're the right person for this job? And you can use the talking points that you created earlier. Yeah, so who's anyone who's answer? interested, yeah, please just uh, let us know in chat right away and we'll pick the first three people that do offer and want to participate in this exercise. And so, uh, or if you want to uh, turn your camera on and maybe just raise your hand, that'll be equally helpful as well. I've got all the cameras on. If your camera is off and you raise your hand, we can't see that you are raising your hand. Anyone interested? This is an opportunity for you to get essentially free coaching. Yeah, and of course, if you wanna follow up with Lynn after this session, you're welcome to. So this could be a great opportunity for you. Okay, so there's one hand that went up. It's from Curtis. So we'll start with Curtis, I guess. So Curtis, okay, Curtis. I guess you want him to unmute, I suppose? Please do, please do. So thank you for volunteering, Curtis. It is a blessing to everybody else here. So what we're gonna do is bridging and you'll unmute yourself and I will ask you the question, why do you think you're the right person for this position? And what you'll do is the last, the last of the three choices, QAA, where you'll tell me a little bit of an answer and then you'll explain what it means to me. Is that is that clear, Curtis? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not I'm not really sure what kind of is this just like an interview question or what? Right, right. So it's like I'm asking you, you know, why do you think you're the right person for this position? And you just get to riff on this, Curtis, because you get to make it all up. So I'm I'm your ideal employer, and I'm asking you okay. why you think you're the right person for the job, and you're going to tell me. Well, I. I've been very good with uh, the technology and I see a lot of things that others don't see. Um, uh, and um, a lot of times I go on a computer and and they have help and, and the help doesn't really help and I'm still able to figure it out. So I'm very good at that help, that help desk. Um, so it's really, you know, that's I'm really looking to help you all in that because uh, I can get it done quicker than most. Uh, I really stand out. 
That's great. That's great, Curtis. So here's how you can make that even better, because the idea that you shared is that you understand the technology, you're a quick study, and you can help others. Mm -hmm. so you can see, I boiled it down to three points because now you know a person can only handle three ideas. That's right. And then one thing you could do after sharing that is tell me a quick story about how you did that for another organization so that I as a listener can better understand it. So what you're doing here is you're bridging to the information that I need to know, which is these three things about you, and then how that showed up in a job that you had before. So that's a skill you'll be able to bring to this one. That makes sense? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. So uh, I, I will make you do it. I will make you do it now. <laughs> okay, right. I, I will make you do it now. But okay. now you know. The idea of bridging is if somebody asks you a question, you give them the answer, but then you make sure that you're able to work in some of the things you know they need to know that are related okay. but they didn't ask for specifically. So let's give Curtis a round of applause for volunteering. Okay. Thanks, Curtis. Okay, so now we'll move on to the next technique, which is called listing. And listing is when you have a couple of things that you want to share in answer to a question. So it could be a process question, and it could be there are, there are three steps to this, or three parts to this, or three phases to this, or you know three things you need to know. And then you list them out. A, B, C, one, two, three, first, second, third. The beautiful thing about listing is that it allows you to hold somebody's attention for longer. If I say there are three steps to this, the person who asked me that question, their brain wants to know what are these three, step, three steps? I don't want to miss anything. So you can hold the floor for longer and share more information without people getting impatient with you. That's the beauty about listing. The problem with listing can be we forget. And what we forget, we start out with, you know, there are three, three reasons for this. One, and we give them that reason. And then we talk, and then we talk, and then we talk. And the person's waiting for, well, are, have we hit reason number two yet? Have we hit reason number three? How long is this person going to be talking? And the idea is, when you say you're going to use listing, you know, A, B, C, one, two, three, don't forget the ones after the first one is it allows you to share more information and gives people the patience and attention to follow all the way through. Okay, so let's try this with, you know, the same question, why do you think you're the right person for this job? And have a volunteer use listing. Well, there are three reasons why. And then you tell us the three reasons. Who's willing to play with that? Obviously, Curtis did not die and we all learned stuff. So who's willing to be our volunteer for listing? Yeah, folks, so if you want to be a volunteer, you can um, raise your hand and uh, or just quickly send a message in chat with your name. And uh, yeah, it looks like Adrian. Okay, it looks like Adrian. Thank you, Adrian. So unmute yourself and have a nice conversation with Lynn. Hello, Lynn hey. and everybody. Thanks so much for volunteering. I appreciate this. So is it Adrian or Adrian? Just Adrian. Adrian. Like Rocky. Thanks, Adrian. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> but not with the husky voice. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Adrian, I want you to think of the three most important things you want me to know about you as a potential employee. And then I'm going to ask you the question, why do you think you're the right person for the job? And you're going to tell me there are three things. And then you'll tell me those three things. That sound cool? Yes. Okay, then let's do it. So Adrian, why do you think you're the right person for this position? Lynn, thank you for that question. And I have three reasons why I think I'm the correct person for this position. One, I am a lifetime learner. I enjoy learning new skill sets and being able to adapt those skill sets to the existing things that I can offer for this position. Number two, I am empathetic and a good listener. I'm able to listen to 
our stakeholders' problems or issues and concerns and able to be able to bring those back to our table and help decipher what needs to be done. Lastly, I consider myself an interpreter. I'm a good a person that can translate problems into solutions. I'm comfortable with working with a global team, so I'm able to be able to uh, decipher what the issues are by, by providing good listening skills and being able to um, provide a good answer for those questions. Adrian, that was wonderful. You gave us three good reasons why you're the right person for the job, and then you gave us a little bit of detail on each, but not so much that we were overwhelmed. And you know, and for I don't know, I can I'll, I'll speak about myself, but I'm I'm sure it's true for other people too. Is that we didn't feel grudging about giving you that attention because we knew that you were making progress toward these, you know, through these three things. And each of them did have some worth to us, and you explained what that worth was. So everybody, give Adrian a round of applause. Well, I'll take three. Thanks again, Adrian. And remember, when you use listing, keep letting us know you're making progress. And by the way, <coughs> the other thing to know, and you can see it's one, two, three. You know people can only hold three ideas in their short-term memory. Do not give them four or five. If you only have two reasons, that's fine too, but three at the most. Otherwise, we move past their, their uh, power to hear what we've got to say. Okay, hooking. And I'm just gonna cover this one quickly because it's my least favorite. Hooking is where you give people a taste of an answer and invite them to ask a follow-up question. So for example, hooking would be, why do you think you're the right person for the job? And you would say, You'd be surprised about what my former employers say they like about me, which is the dot, dot, dot part. So then I say, well, what do your former employers say that they like about you? And then I answer that. I don't like hooking for well, this particular kind of hooking for two reasons. First, it can be kind of smarmy. It can be like you're forcing them to ask you the same question twice. And people can get impatient with that. And the other thing is that you lose control of the conversation by using hooking. Because you say, you'll be surprised about what my former employers say that they like about working with me. It's like you're winking at the person. Ask me the follow-up question. Ask me the follow-up question. And sometimes people aren't tracking and they won't do it. And so you're left hanging. It's a technique, I present it, but I don't recommend using it. So hooking is where you give people a taste of an answer and invite them to ask you a follow-up question so you can be more specific. There are better ways to answer the questions, but I share this because it is one. You may find a great reason to hook. Which then takes us to flagging. And flagging is where we tell people we're about to share something really important, listen up. Because when my brain hears something is supposed to, something important is coming, I don't want to miss it. So flagging language is things like, if you remember nothing else about our conversation today, remember this, or here's something that you really need to know, or this is key, or this is important. So it's language like that, that signals to somebody that you're about to share something they really need to be paying attention to. So who wants to be my volunteer for flagging? Who wants to tell us the most important thing that any potential employer should know about him or her. So who's our who's our next volunteer? So if you're interested in volunteering and getting a, getting involved with this uh, exercise, either raise your hand or put your name in chat. And this is the last exercise today. Of course, you can follow up with Lynn later, but anyone interested in participating? We're not calling on you. I see a few faces, I'm not gonna point but if you're interested, we'd be happy to uh, have you participate that way. And if you've previously participated and no one else raises the hand, you can participate a second time. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna turn on the Jeopardy music and see how long it takes. Well, and, and actually, so what I'll ask you to do instead is type in the chat some kind of flagging language that you would use. So maybe it's like the word important or crucial or something. So type in flagging language so the rest of us can see that. 
And while you're doing that, I'll let you know, there is a limitation on flagging. You cannot use that for, to answer every question. Because if you're saying, well, this is the most important thing you need to know, or this is key, if you keep saying that to every question that somebody asks you and you're answering, then you've just blown this. You can only use flagging occasionally when something really is a memorable thing you want somebody to take away from the conversation. So flagging, use it, you know, use it strategically. Okay, so one of the most important things I've learned, right? It's stuff like that. Once again, when our brains hear something is important, we don't want to miss it, so we'll listen up. You can bring somebody's flagging attention back to you by using flagging. And finally, summarizing. You know, because Alex said it before, do you have, if somebody asks you if you have any other questions? And I love his technique. And here's another one that you can consider. Because when they ask you that question, it truly is a signal of this is the end. What you can do in this moment is summarize the most important ideas that you have shared with them throughout this conversation that you want them to remember. <coughs> so it could be. You know, what, I really, what I really want to leave you with is this point and then you share it with them. So it could be, your, you know, I know that you're facing an employee retention challenge. And the person who steps into this position needs to address this quickly. I've done this at another organization, I've done this at several organizations where I've significantly reduced uh, employee, uh, employee turnover and increased employee satisfaction. And those organizations were able to raise their revenue by an average of 30%. If I'm here, if we get the chance to work together, I know that I can bring these skills and these talents to bear for your organization, which will help increase your employee satisfaction and your productivity and your bottom line. So instead of the, are there any other questions that you have for me? The answer becomes, here's what, here's what I want you to remember. You summarize all of the important points that you've shared, and that's the note that you leave them on. So any other questions on strategic Q&A? Okay, here's the truth. You do these things all the time, you've just never had a name for them. And ultimately, the goal is to practice this stuff enough so that without thinking, your brain will say, oh, I need to use bridging, and then you'll use bridging, or listing, or flagging, or summarizing. Skip the hooking part. When you do this enough, it'll, it'll feel like a struggle for starters because you're, you're paying attention to it now, and you're not just doing automatic. But the more you do this, the more seamless it will be and the more effective you will be at answering questions because you're not just telling them the answer to the question that they've asked, you're giving them usable information that they need to make a good decision. Okay, all right, because there are time issues, what I'm gonna do is you're going to get, if you sign up for it, a, a, an outline of all the good stuff we've covered. So as we were talking about earlier, and Michael raised the question, what happens when you're dealing with people who don't ask you questions in an honorable way? There's the omniscient authority who, who expects you to answer, you know, to know the answer to every question and punishes you if you don't. There's the machine gun, the person who keeps asking you questions and never allows you to answer any of them. There's the interrupter who never lets you finish an answer to anything. There's the paraphraser who just re, you know, twists your words in a direction that you did not intend. The color commentator, the person who just makes a snarky remark about what you said and doesn't even bother to ask you a question. The silencer, you finish answering a question and the person just stares at you and expects you to be so uncomfortable, you'll keep babbling. And then the investigator, the person who's asking you questions that, you know, that he or she knows you shouldn't answer and is probing for information that you shouldn't be sharing. Once again, all that stuff will show up in the outline for you. 
How do you deal with these people? I'll share those techniques with you. We've covered a lot of ground. What you're doing before the interview, in addition to the things that you've already done before, you're going to a deeper level. You're writing your goals. You're creating those messages. You're developing those stories. And then building rapport, how you do it on screen, how you do it in person, the ways that you connect with people. And then the strategic Q&A, how you turn every question you've been asked into the right one by how you answer it. You find ways to deliver not just the information they've asked for, but the information you know they need to know. And what I want you to do right now is get out that sheet of paper and write down the one thing you're going to try in the next week because you heard it today. One thing. And my overachievers know you can't have three. One thing. So maybe it's you'll make sure that you write goals for the next interview you're going to have. And obviously, this stuff can work for meetings beyond, you know, beyond interviews. It could be that you'll sit down and you'll create those messages. It could be that you'll practice doing bridging, listing, flagging, or summarizing. What's one thing you're gonna do? Because here's the truth, it's neuroscience again. Within a week, you will forget 80% of what we talked about today. And if you don't take action on something within a week, chances are good you never will. And I want more than that for you. I want this to make a difference. So choose the one thing that you're going to do within the next week. It's either a deeper level of something that you're already doing or something brand new for you. And then I want you to tell one person that you're doing this and then let them know how it worked out. Because we all make promises to ourselves all the time and we are full of crap. Because as soon as you get off this call, you will face the giant wall of inertia which is, oh, well, I've got too many other things to do, and you'll find all kinds of rationales and excuses to not do something. Because it's the most powerful force in the universe, staying the same is what we're designed to do so that we stay safe. Step out of that and choose the one thing you're gonna do, share that with one other person, and then report back to that person on the progress that you made. So, if you wanna get the notes from this, I, I'd be happy to send them to you. So all you need to do is you can see my email address there is lynn at lynnfranklin.com. Just send me an email that says interview on it and I will share the notes from today. You know, David mentioned my TEDx talk on how to be a mind reader. There's the link for it. I also do persuasion bite videos on YouTube. So if you want to be more persuasive on a particular topic, you can go there and check that stuff out. I do a blog, you can sign up for that if you want uh, regular doses of neuroscience, business communication and humor. Or you can connect with me on LinkedIn. And frankly, it would truly be a blessing for me if you would connect with me on LinkedIn and do a testimonial about this experience that we had this morning. Because as David mentioned, none of the people who speak before you have any expectation that we will get business or, you know, or that we're getting paid. We do this to give back and to give forward. So if you found this useful and you're willing to say so on LinkedIn, that would be a true gift back to me. I appreciate that and I'm happy to answer any other questions that folks have. So there is one question posted from Jerry. What are your thoughts on the last question being, is there anything I should clarify to help you move on to the next stage of the interview process? And this is a question I, I want to make sure I understand. This is a question that you're being asked or you are asking? You are asking. You're asking if there's anything that they need, that you need to clarify for them so that they can take the next step. So what are your thoughts on the last question? Is there anything I should clarify to help you move me to the next stage in the interview process? Mm -hmm. You know, and once again, I'm going to defer to Alex. Alex, how would you feel about getting a question like that? Uh, uh, you know, it's funny. Then you read my mind because I was thinking that you would do that. Mm -hmm. Look, yeah. uh, I was asked this question many, many times, and I am a very experienced interviewer. Mm -hmm. If you ask me this question, 
I say, no, you are a very good candidate, but let me be honest. I already interviewed two people. You are number three. I still have next week to interview two. Uh, we will make a decision thereafter. Because you are not going to corner me to tell you right now why I love you and why I'm going to make you an offer. Okay, fair enough. It's true. Yeah, people don't. Uh, and and Alex, you say that because you don't. Did that question make you feel pressured? No, no, no. My policy has been all these years since I started interviewing people. I want to be fair with people. By the way, that's a topic we can write a book about it. <laughs> Anyhow. And it being fair, it's not fair for me to give you a feel that I like you or that I don't like you. It's simply not fair as a human to human relationship. I never, I can tell you that if when I interviewed people and if you exit my office and somebody says, so how was it? I can guarantee you the person will say, I don't know. Because I, I don't want them to feel either great or poor because of my reaction. Because, you know, it's not over until it's over. I may love you, Lynn, you're wonderful, I'm ready to hire you, but tomorrow David will show up and, oh my God, you dwarf next to David. David is fantastic. So, you know, mm -hmm. when the interview process is over, I interviewed all five to seven people, then I make a decision. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Alex, let me ask you this follow-up question because I think that will will serve the person who asked this question well as well. And that is, what is the best way for a job candidate to end a job conversation? First of all, a high level of enthusiasm. Link, I don't know how to thank you for spending time with me today. I learned so much about your company. Not only that, but I learned a lot about you. And I can assure you, I can sense my personality is so much aligned with your personality. So in terms of working together, that, that, that certainly would be, my, would be my pleasure. And I, I really hope that hopefully we have a future together. Right. And, you know, and that's part of the technique of honestly complimenting people. Yep. And it's also about summarizing. So and, and making the person feel good about the end of the interview. And because that's a comment that is also energizing for the person who's on the receiving end. So thanks for sharing yep. that, Alex. I appreciate yep. it. Allow me to make one more comment or shall I wait until you're done? I, I have one more comment to make. Go right ahead. Uh, when Adrian answered yeah, the, the question, I don't remember what the question was. What, what, um, why should we hire you? Something in the in the realm. Am I correct? I, I'm and sorry, I, my, my, go ahead. And you know what? Um, I like. I really liked how Adrian answered. But remember who I am. I am the interviewer. And. Uh, the first question is, Lynn, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing with me. But why, why should I believe you? Remember who I am. I am the buyer. You are the seller. You told me A, B, and C. Why should I believe you, Lynn, uh, uh, Adrian? You told me those things. So that's one thing. So namely, not only you have to say, I am a good team member, and in fact, I can share with you, two years ago, I was singled out by my boss uh, and actually invited me and my team to, to a lunch because I did this. So don't only say it, qualify it and make it memorable. That's one. Because otherwise, I don't remember. Honestly, right now, I remember Adrian gave three answers. If you say, Alex, I'll give you $1,000 right now. Tell me what they are. I said, keep you thousand dollars because I don't remember. Her answer was not memorable. So that's one. The other thing I want to say is this. I always work with my clients and tell them, don't attempt to blend into the crowd. Be different, be unique. So when you say something, Adrian should have said something that she is unique and not similar to other people. Yeah, and Alex's point's well taken, and, and it's something that we mentioned, Adrian, 
And that is tell a quick story about each of those to show, once again, you're showing rather than telling. And as Alex is saying, that's more memorable. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, something memorable, that, that's my point. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else have question? And all that remains for me is to thank you for playing along with me today. And if I can send you the, uh, the outline for the program, or if we can connect on LinkedIn, saying, hey, Lynn, this was the thing I found really memorable about the program or the thing I found most useful. I'd appreciate that. But mostly what I want you to do is do the one thing that you've committed to. Try one new thing this, this next week because let's make a difference and get you closer to wherever it is that you want to go. If it's a new position, fine. If it's better communication with the people that you're working with now or a client, also fine. This stuff works across different situations and I want you to use it to get more of what you want. Thanks for playing with me today. Well, Lynn, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I so appreciate you being a friend of PSG of Mercer County and giving of your time and yourself. Um, I so enjoyed this program. I was in my seat the whole time and I'm absolutely going to send you a referral. And I'm so appreciative also that we connected. And um, among the things that I liked were actually some of the points right at the beginning of your program, the simple comment you made, being nervous is okay. And a lot of people think of that as being a detriment, but you know, I've heard a lot of stage actors say that they're nervous and have stage fright right until they, you know, the curtain opens and they say the first line. And so I think it's natural to have that nervousness, but use the energy of it and um, so I, it was terrific. I, I just agreed with that point right from the beginning. And I also think, you know, you're spot on. I agree with the points of writing down your goals and writing down your messages and writing down your stories. Because if we're just thinking them through, this could be more than three things we're going to start forgetting. So, you know, you said, well, you know, our short term memory is only going to hold three things. But if we write it down, we have an opportunity to commit it to our long term memory. So I think that was. As simple as it was, it was also very important. So those were just terrific tips uh, that you gave. Uh, and, and, you know, I had to chuckle a little bit, you know, hearing the three things that you mentioned in short-term memory. It just seems that humans in general, so it must be your neuroscience discovery that you've learned. Everything we do in life is through. Um, I worked with a landscaper in my house and they said, you want to put these three, three of the same bushes here, three of the same bushes there, and three of the, it was always three, three, three. Or think about any joke that you heard. Three people walk into a bar, right? The first person has a situation, the second person, but the third one is the joke. You, you never say 35 people walked into a bar. So <laughs> I, the, there's, uh, I guess, science behind that magic. And thank you for sharing that. And right. uh, <laughs> and just want to say in, in, in respect and honor of your neuroscience background that I, I knew you had a neuroscience nerd, you told me as much, but I have my brain coffee cup here and it does say on each of the lobes which lobe it is. This is my travel mug, it's actually my wife's because she is a neuroscience, but I, I took it for this presentation today thinking of you. But um, thank you so much for this wonderful program. Uh, Glad to be a part of it. Lynn, I have a, a question for you because I think in a slightly different way it relates. In my case, I'm no longer looking for a job. I'm starting up a business as a website developer. And since I'm brand new at doing it and I've only done certain things, when you want to present to a person and you know that person's looking for something beyond what you've done, how do you do it in a, such a way? And I've been going through these coaching calls for, with this class I've been taking on developing your own business. And several people have asked the same question is, and I, and I think it's kind of related to what you've said today is imposter syndrome. You know, that you're presenting yourself as somebody you know you're really not yet. You know, it, it's someplace you want to get to. But to get the experience, you have to get the work. So you do have to take a client that you know the work is going to be a little harder. But somehow you have to convince or come across to them 
as somebody who already knows what they're talking about, even though you may not have done exactly that before. So it's a little unnerving, at least I find it to be. You know, and, and I, I can just speak from my own experience there, because obviously, uh, you know, I started my own practice, that's going to be 29 years ago in, in June. And one of the, when I knew there was a job that had, a, a, had something that I, that I personally couldn't do, I would tell, I would be honest about that. And I would say, I believe in the team of experts approach, because I know what I know, I know what I don't know, and I won't do what I can't do well. So I will bring other people in who are experts in the areas that I'm not. And, and the reason that I do this is that I don't want to have a bunch of employees sitting around here who don't necessarily, who aren't necessarily the right solution for you, but I need to fill up their time. Instead, I'll bring in people who already know how to do this and they can do it quickly and serve you well. So my response was always team of experts approach. Mm -hmm. which lets them know I know what I know, you know I, I will stay in the areas where I can make an impact for you and if we go beyond that stuff I will bring in other experts so you get the counsel and the action that you need and it's not always going to be me mm -hmm. because that's you being honest and it earns you some credibility points and it also lets people know that you you have a thoughtful answer to this as opposed to well you know yeah I can figure it out Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, you know, we're gonna keep the microphone open, but the recording off in just a couple of minutes wanna just wrap up the meeting. I, I thought that was an interesting answer because that's the way I have my IT practices. I act as kind of a, uh, the general contractor. And if I need to bring in others, I will. Um, so very, very thoughtful answer. Um, I wanna let you know, I'll make it easy, folks. Lynn said we can only remember two thing, three things. I'm gonna give you two things to remember, which is uh, what we're doing over the next two weeks at PSG of Mercer County. So next week, it'll be May 6th. I can't believe it'll be May already. Terrence Seaman will be here. Terry will be here to talk about well-being for job seekers. You know, conducting a job search can take a toll and can affect us mentally, maybe even physically. So Terry's going to talk about some good tips for well-being for job seekers. That's next week. And so Terry will be back. And the following week, May 13th, lucky Friday the 13th, and I'm a fan of Friday the 13th, Abby Kohut will be here. Absolutely, Abby will be here to talk about success for the seasoned search, the benefit of being overqualified. So if you are someone who you who is an older employee you have to decide if you're older or not and you think that there's been some concern about being an older person in a younger marketplace if you think that's where you are abby's going to talk about some great tips uh, in order to manage the benefit of being overqualified that thought so that's what we'll be doing here the next two weeks of course you can always visit our website event calendar it's well populated into i believe july by now and so you can take a look and see presenters and topics that will be of most interest to you um, other groups coming up, uh, the Breakfast Club of New Jersey will be meeting on Saturday, May 14th. John Hadley, career coach John Hadley, will be talking about turning interviews into offers. And remember, next week, May 5th, the library, Princeton Public Library, is having a hybrid event, both in person and virtual. And it's author Jeremy uh, Schiffling on conquering LinkedIn. So I'm gonna be there in person. Uh, they do not have a mask requirement any longer, but masks are optional if you'd like. And if you are in person, they're gonna have a book giveaway. Uh, also our cousin organizations, our lovely cousin organizations have presentations and programs. PSG of Central New Jersey on Mondays at 10.30 in the morning, PSGCNJ.biz. And PSG of Mar Mercer, I'm sorry, Morris County, PSG of Morris County, PSGMC.org, Wednesdays at 9.30 in the morning. So that's all what's coming up in the next couple of weeks. So I do hope that we get to see you all very soon, either virtually or hopefully soon in person. Uh, but until that time comes, we will simply say, bye, everybody.